Welcome to Inside the Firm, a podcast dedicated to small business owners and hosted by entrepreneurs, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Each week, they take you on their journey of how to start, run, and grow a business by bringing you inside their architecture and real estate development firm. Get a behind the scenes tour of how these business leaders manage their clients and foster company culture while creating new and innovative projects. And now your host, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Welcome to another edition of Inside the Firm. I am one of your co-hosts, Al, the prophet of profit. Prophet of profit, everybody. I'm here with Lance. Meh. (laughs) (laughs) Prophet of meh? I didn't have a day for you, so I was like, meh, meh. And we are here to talk to you (laughs) today about uh, what's happening in the economy now and what might be happening in the long term. Do you also have listener questions? I have a listener question. Ooh, yeah. we'll go there. Which we love, by the way, everybody. If you haven't ever sent us in one, yeah. I will. A- I will end. There isn't a question off limits for me. Maybe for Al. I can't speak for. Who knows? I, he's a prophet. I can't speak for the prophet of prophet. That's impossible. That's <laughs> that's impossible. Especially when your middle name is Meh. But if you have, if I, I will answer. We will answer your questions. Mm-hmm. LMC at F9 Productions dot com or AKG oh. at F9 Productions dot com. Too funny. First, though, I want to talk about. If you want to grow your business, let's build profit fast. If you haven't listened to the previous episode, go do it. Um, you can listen there, or you can go to Build a Better Co for company, buildabetterco.com. I have to fix this link, but you can also watch basically our five shifts to five figure profit per month and more. Go there and check that out. Good looking Lance. website, Al. Good looking website. Thank you. If you're also looking for product data and you can't find the product data you're looking for, I'm here to tell you, you might be using the wrong search engine. Broad search results in consumer products, out of date information, and websites that hide or don't have information you're looking for. If you need specifications, CAD, BIM, RCAT.com is your search engine. Find and download the up to date data you need fast. That's ARCAT.com. It is free and requires no registration. So try ARCAT today. That's ARCAT.com. Last but certainly not least, maybe the most, go to Pelaluxury.com forward slash the firm today so you can experience a collection of brands that brings your creative vision to life. The luxury division of Pella is a world class collection of brands, including Duratherm, Riley, and Bonelli, all pioneers of industry who provide window and or solutions to discerning architects. The building industry and beyond. During this new year, we know how important it is to step back and spend time in gratitude. We appreciate all our clients trusting us with their projects in a record-breaking year. We are excited and ready to take on this new year in 2023. The luxury division of Pella doesn't push beyond the limits. They set them. Explore PellaLuxury.com forward slash the firm today. Did you have to extend that or did I just go that fast running up? Ow. The prophet of profit. If you're watching on YouTube, you just saw he he even knows he is prophetic to the point where he knows exactly how long my copies are gonna be when I read them. So what are you waiting for? <laughs> Head on over to what am I saying? <laughs> Buildabetterco.com. 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 Okay, because I mean, speaking of coincidences or whatever, I have to give a shout out. Lance and I both got sent this book. It's called Profit with presence. So another alliteration, another thing about, about profit. Um, the reason why I want to shout it out is, is thank you for the book. Um, I'm sure this summer, t- this time I'll read it. We don't know who gave it to us. Who is the author? Is it Eric uh, yeah. Holzapple? Yeah. He sent it to us? I think so. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. <coughs> if you do send us stuff, just make sure that you put a little note in it. Um, I think it was the author. I don't know. I should check. We should we, we should get have books from other people that's not the yeah, author. Yeah, exactly. It might not have been. But we but anyway, on that note also, if you ever want to send us gifts, <laughs> do it. 825 Christman Drive, number 100, Longmont, Colorado, 80501. Okay? Just uh, please. Chocolates. Lent is almost home. We're semi chocolates. <laughs> Dude, if they come and you're not here, I hope there's only like five of them and I want to eat all of them. Wouldn't that be awesome? (laughs) So there we go. Okay, let's get into it today. Yeah, I'm interested in the economy and I'm glad you're starting. I think you're starting out with 
uh, Billings, perfect. So directly related to architects, the architect uh, um, American Institute of Architects, February Billings continued decline. Al. So in January we show, uh, saw a little decline. That's normally normal for us. February was slow, not as bad as January. So it was actually probably up in February from January. But the numbers came in at 48. So remember, 50 is that your billings are the same as last month. <clears throat> January score was 49.3. So what that means is, let's just say that December was 50 for this argument. January was less than that. And then February was less than January, which is even less mm -hmm. than before. Mm -hmm. So negative 1.3 for billings, negative 0.2 for project inquiries, which isn't that much, negative 2.1 for design contracts. Um, I feel like people are waking up from uh, the winter th th is thawing. It, yes, and it, it was a it was a genuinely cold, cold winter um, throughout the United States. That's it's very obvious. I'm just going to two things. I got 150 percent snowpack in Colorado. We have 50% awesome. over the snow that we usually need we, to like supply us and all of that. And then like in Wyoming, it's like 200%. Dude, California, California ha had so much, but they had to let it into the sea because they weren't prepared. What? I, I, I love that. Hey, this is a big deal. We never have enough snow. We, we never, never have enough have water. water. And then you do. And you're like, ah, I don't know what to do with it. The worst. Great, job. great job. You're doing a great yeah. job over Good there. Good job, Newsom. Okay. Good job. Let's make those policies everyone's policies. Yeah. Was that all you had? That's all was I had. Snow was like, I just, I agree. It's thought out. I had, uh, I just signed three projects this week. That's the most I've signed in the last week. I would say the last whatever business days. Um, that's the most I've had uh, per per week uh, since last year. So it is picking up. Uh, I was on the. I was hopefully going to sign a fourth, but <clears throat> and now I'll hear back on Monday. Yep. And uh, inquiries are going up. So from our standpoint, it's going a lot better. I will say the one big thing for other architects, too, is if you're only concentrating in, uh, if you're concentrating on just new construction, you know, I'm not sure, like, if it helps you be if it less daunting for you to consider doing remodels, that's probably going to be one of the biggest bridges to sort of if they're if this lull continues with the you know like per the billings and everything I think because and he, the simple factor is people who were able to refinance their homes during during this last downturn with covid and everything when we had the super low interest rates between like 2 and 3% they are married to that and they're not willing to let go of that for a while so what does that mean they're probably not going to move and get a 5 6 7 7 7% mortgage their buying power is less it makes more sense for them to do remodel work and additions and stuff like that. Um, so uh, that's my take. I, I think just uh, we always preach divert, try to, you know, diversity through strength in terms of business. That's that's where it's at. Absolutely. Um, some good news in the economy. Uh, job growth totals 236,000 in March. That's near expectation. So why that's good news is because. Hiring used to beat expectations by a whole bunch, especially the last report. And what that signaled to uh, Jerome Powell was mm. to raise interest rates. Yeah. The expectations from, I think, Dow Jones was 238 and came in at 236. So that's all great. I, I w I'm not surprised uh, that hiring continues just because of uh, the uh, retirement, a whole bunch of people retiring and all that. Um, but that... And the consumer price index uh, r rose 6% over last year in February, the slowest se since September How new is this article? This one is... Okay, a month still. So we're, we're on the verge. Next week, I think we'll get the next r ratings. And hopefully it just keeps, continues yep. to slow a little bit. And, and I think that what all this is pointing to and why I, I say that this is good news is I think Fed interest rate raise will be zero. Oh, now you're going to zero. You did, well, didn't you call the last one though? They're still going to raise it, right? Twenty five. I, I think it was zero. I think I wanted them to do zero, but I I can't remember someone oh, or twenty five percent. Yeah. I what what do you think? Well, I think they should. I think they're going to raise it again by twenty five percent. Do you really? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think they still seal. I mean that the I think I think they still seal see a 
strong economy from their standpoint. It all looks it's all, it's so weird like where you're looking at this, right? Because like the the tech sector, the fallout there is just incredible. But a lot of people think that they overhired. Um and they know, did. And they did. And they did. They did overhire. So now they're just kind of correcting themselves. Yeah. Still a lot of construction work. I mean, then the construction side of things like I'm booked out 18 months. It's incredible. It, it, so it took me it took me pretty much 3 months. I told my wife this on vacation. I was like, it took me 3 months to figure out 18. Like this is incredible. This is like a first time in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, architecture wise, like we, you know, everybody who listens to this show, they know it was a pretty slow start to the year, but it's picking up. And I can't say the same for the architecture side of things. Um, I think I think the last time I looked, it was because we set up everything in QuickBooks. I think we're booked out like we have billable work for like six months, something like that, which is still good. Yep, and I still need to update it and yeah. stuff like that. Oh, look, see, he's got he's. Not very prophetic with that. Well, I, <laughs> I did. You'll know from the hey, course. Hey, isn't are we trying to do? Isn't that prophetic? Isn't it literally prophetic how we're trying to set that up in QuickBooks? How dare yeah. you? <laughs> <laughs> to know how far are we out and yeah. all that. Absolutely. Um, okay, so that's what's happening in basically uh, short term. A lagging measure. I agree. A lagging measure. Yeah. And I just I, I just remember going to the International Building Show. Y- you didn't come with me, I think. It was you and Jason. Jason. And, and asking, like, hey, what's going to happen in the economy? And they're like, oh, everything looks great. And then COVID happens, right? Yeah. And Because they said, barring, barring something crazy going to happen. Yeah. So there is something crazy that could happen. And I want to put, I want to put, give air to both the negative and the positive spin to it. So two weeks ago, I was ranting and raving like a lunatic about dollar dominance. You know what's so crazy too? Sorry. I'm on the same thing I'm talking about here is like they is the Fed doing what we said they could possibly do? I think we said it like late last year or earlier this year like they could thread the needle perfectly. You know what I mean? There you had this SBF, SBV or SB yeah, yeah. whatever it is, fallout based from the crypto fallout and like uh, the money hasn't frozen yet. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's pretty. But maybe you're getting onto something. I don't know. Sorry. Anyways, I, I mean, I would say they only have about a half point more to go, or a full point before. Like a half point would be a strong yellow warning of you're going too much. A whole half point, and I mean, if the even if you break it apart into twenty five, twenty five, because you're not getting any efficiencies through this. Efficiencies need to come through production now. You've already constricted the money supply side as as much as i think is reasonable. they really did push it to the edge obviously and then the, when they had to bed do the backstop and the full fdic yep. deposit uh guarantee i mean i just i'm but i'm still shocked at how did n- how didn't anybody i don't think anybody from the chicago school or the mises uh you know the idea or like any any of anybody in the austrian business school any of these theories who criticized the Fed so much? I've never heard anybody bring up that 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 point that they would be able to like. Well, you know, they have an ace up their sleeve. They can insure all deposits. Hm, never even thought of that. Like, what a dummy! I feel dumb by that. Like, it's like that's a pretty big deal. I'm not saying it's the right deal. I'm just saying right. they did have they did have another option. Yeah. Yep. Um. So, anyways, two weeks ago I was ranting and raving, and then about a week <clears> ago, <throat> mm-hmm. um. I'm going to show you a couple different clips, one from Fox News and one from CNN. So let's go to about a minute. But bef- before he cl- before he hits play, yep. Uh, I highly encourage you, if you're a Twitter user, follow Wall Street Silver. They're fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Well, good morning, Will. It's great to be with you. And it's really hard to overstate exactly how catastrophic the abandonment of the U.S. dollar would be. Um, as the world's uh, global reserve currency. Look, since the end of World War II, the dollar has been the safe place to go, and it's been backed up by a couple of things. It originally was backed up by gold, but President Nixon took, took us off the gold standard, so there's no hard asset backing up the dollar anymore for the last 50 years. But also it's been backed up by the strength and economic power of the United States and the fact that oil has always been traded in dollars. If that were to end, that would mean the end of the U.S. dollar. Look, there is a perfect storm happening right now, Will. 
the, the world's uh, reserve currency being that uh, having that status has been a real privilege but we've abused the privilege by wholly reckless monetary and fiscal policies over many years certainly over the last couple of years which has really devalued the dollar on top of that now you do have this perfect storm of Biden's weakness his war on American domestic energy production the Ukraine war and as you point out because of all of these things we've got America's enemies led by China forming a new economic block and all it would take at this point now because we're at this pivotal moment will mm -hmm. is for Saudi Arabia who has indicated that they're open to this to say you know what we're going to be open to considering other currencies to trade in oil if that were to happen there would be a complete implosion of the global economic system but certainly the American economic system and if that were to happen, you'd be looking at sky high inflation, just raging Weimar Republic kind of inflation. If you think inflation is bad now, just wait. But more importantly, we would lose our economic dominance and we would right. lose our superpower status. Uh, Monica, the world's reserve currency, you said it's a privilege for the United States for the dollar to have been the world's currency. What how does that relate to each individual American? How has that changed or impacted or improved our lives throughout the last several decades? Yeah, I mean, it's given the United States incredible dominance um, in, in the world in terms of the economic system and in terms of trade. It's kept prices down. Mm. So whether it's energy prices, whether it's your food prices, the, the entire global economic system is reliant on the safe and secure dollar. But that is no longer true, again, because we've been printing money like crazy and devalued right. uh, the power of the dollar and the value of the dollar. But on top of of it now again oil is the critical linchpin of this if Saudi Arabia decides to join with America's enemies here and start trading oil in different currencies that is going to undermine the entire global right. economic system and here at home you know what it's going to mean for us it's going to mean raging inflation so much worse than anything we have ever experienced well yeah. and I'll tell you they're setting it up so that they can then come to the rescue by introducing some Central bank digital currencies. Right. If they were to do that, and the United States already has a pilot program, that means the loss of your individual economic freedom because the government will have total access and control of everything you buy and sell and the ability to turn it off like wow. that. Ominous warning. I hear you. Saudi Arabia is the tipping point. Oil trading in dollars is the tipping point. So uh, that's Fox News. I'll go to uh, uh, CNN. Hey, fair and balanced over here. Yep. But does it make sense to you, and it probably does, why inflation would skyrocket if that happened? Because our dollar would have even less value? No, because the dollars that would be used in all of these international trades would then go away, so there would be so much dollars on the market that why would you need yeah, those exactly, dollars? Yeah, exactly, exactly, like, exactly. So that's, that's There would be so much excess back, of dollars. That's the back. That's the uh, lead up to our dollar would have even less purchasing power because yeah. then there's so many of them uh, that we have to account for rather than the world. Yep. Okay, CNN. Here's my take. The most interesting outcome of the three-day summit between Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping got limited media attention. Describing their talks, Putin said, we are in favor of using the Chinese yuan for settlements between Russia and the countries of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So, the world's second largest economy and its largest energy exporter are together actively trying to dent the dollar's dominance as the anchor of the international financial system. Will they succeed? The dollar is America's last surviving superpower. It gives Washington unrivaled economic and political muscle. It can slap sanctions on countries unilaterally which frees that country out of large parts of the world economy. And Washington can spend freely, certain that its debt will be bought up by the rest of the world. The war against Ukraine, combined with Washington's increasingly confrontational approach to China, have created a perfect storm in which both Russia and China are accelerating efforts to diversify away from the dollar. Their central banks are keeping less of their reserves in dollars, and most trade between them is being settled in the yuan. 
They are also making efforts to get other countries to follow suit. The Biden administration has handled the economic war against Russia extremely effectively by building a coalition of almost all the world's advanced economies. That makes it hard to escape from the dollar into other highly valued stable currencies like the euro or the pound or the Canadian dollar because those countries are also warring with Russia. What might have been a sharper turning point for the dollar's role was Donald Trump's decision in May 2018 to pull out of the Iran nuclear deal. The European Union was strenuously opposed to this move, but it watched as the dollar's dominance meant that Iran was immediately excluded from the world economy. Jean-Claude Juncker, then president of the European Commission, proposed enhancing the euro's role internationally to shield the continent from what he called selfish unilateralism. The Commission outlined a path to achieve this. It hasn't happened. There remain too many fundamental doubts about the future of the euro itself. Dollar dominance is firmly entrenched for many good reasons. A globalized economy needs a single currency for ease and efficiency. The dollar is stable. You can buy and sell it any time, and it's governed largely by the market and not the whims of a government. That's why China's efforts to expand the yuan's role internationally have not worked. Ironically, if Xi Jinping wanted to cause the greatest pain to America, he would liberalize his financial sector and make the yuan a true competitor to the dollar. But that would take him in the direction of markets and openness that is the opposite of his current domestic goals. All that said, Washington's weaponizing of the dollar over the last decade has led many important countries to search for ways to make sure that they do not become the next Russia. The numbers are revealing. The share of dollars in global central bank reserves has dropped from roughly 70% 20 years ago to less than 60% today and falling steadily. The Europeans and the Chinese are trying to build international payment systems outside the dollar-dominated SWIFT. Saudi Arabia has flirted with the idea of pricing its oil in yuan. India is settling most of its oil purchases from Russia in non-dollar currencies. Digital currencies might be another alternative, and in fact, China's central bank has created one. All of these alternatives add costs. But the last few years should have taught us that increasingly nations are willing to pay a price when they want political goals to trump economic ones. We keep searching for the single replacement for the dollar, and there will not be one. But could the currency suffer weakness by a thousand cuts? That seems a more likely scenario. The author and investor Ruchir Sharma points out, right now, for the first time in my memory, we have an international financial crisis in which the dollar has been weakening rather than strengthening. I wonder if this is a sign of things to come. If it is, Americans should worry. I spoke last week about the bad geopolitical habits Washington has developed because of its unrivaled unipolar status. It's even more true economically. America's politicians have gotten very used to spending seemingly without any concern about deficits. Public debt in America has risen almost five-fold, from roughly $6.5 trillion 20 years ago to $31.5 trillion today. The Fed has solved a series of financial crises by massively expanding its balance sheet almost 12-fold, from around $730 billion 20 years ago to about $8.7 trillion today. All of this only works because of the dollar's unique status. If that were to wane, America will face a reckoning like none before. A reckoning like none before. Um, so <clears throat> what's happening now, there's actually a, a positive development, but in a negative development. Russia and China are spearheading this with Saudi Arabia, but also the because they already made an agreement with Saudi Arabia. But Russia, China, the BRICS uh, countries, you, Brazil, India, and South Africa have decided that they are going to develop a new currency, Lance. Mm -hmm. A new currency. The last time this happened was the euro, right? So the positive thing is you can look back at what happened at the euro. The euro was initially developed so that when you go over there, countries, you know, 
you'd have one instead of having whatever the French French used to have Italian Frank Frank right. And at first it started like that, and then the countries used it for trade. Mm-hmm. The, <clears throat> those European countries are about twenty five percent of the world GDP. United States is about twenty five percent world of the GDP. The world did not end when that happened. The BRICS are about twenty five percent of GDP, right? So if they use it. Um, and the thing that happens though is that things happen quicker now than before. Like there, uh, this line from Ernest Hemingway: um, "Gradually, then suddenly." It's kind of like when the banks fail. Gradually, all the changes of the Fed led up to a sudden catastrophe. So that sudden catastrophe is there. But if it happens in the way that the euro happened, like oh, they're just trading with each other, that's fine. The problem though is that. When they make that currency, China has already made deals with uh, mo- most of the Asian countries and also the South American countries that they can trade oil in that. So that's where the hyperinflation goes. Mm-hmm. So that's the bad part. The good part is like if it's like the European Union, dollar just has another competition. Maybe the Fed has something up their sleeve where somehow they can just like um, – suck up all those extra dollars somehow and destroy them. I have no idea how that would actually happen, but maybe they have some sort of trick up their sleeves. The last part that's kind of scary about it is um, I'm trying to develop this, this concept where like truth comes from the spoon that feeds you. That's where truth comes from for people. I'm not saying that's right. That's how the world operates. Sure. Is that's where truth comes from. Right. You're um, and. You have India, China, and Russia, and now Brazil, but India is a huge addition. Creating a currency with Russia. Whose side are those countries on? Probably not yours, Al. What does that say about if things escalate? Do you think China and India are now going to say, yeah, we're, we'll help you out and put pressure on Russia. No, 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 no. What's feeding China is this this agreement that they have. It's the opposite. I mean, it is that if you talk about two uh, axes yeah. of a war, yeah. I mean, this is absolutely huge. This is absolutely huge. I'm in a positive mood today, <clears throat> so I I'm not freaking out about it, but it's. It's just interesting, the developments here. We'll probably talk about it for sure again in August because that's when they're going to meet, the BRICS are, and that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa uh, because there's also foreign ministers that are interested in joining them, which are Turkey, Mexico, Indonesia, Argentina, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, and Egypt, um, and then a bunch of African countries. So so I like a large consortium of, of, of the of the GDP of the world, right? And that, but they're supposed to meet in August, and then they're supposed to decide, and that's when they think they're going to form the currency. So, uh, it's interesting. Just, just stay tuned. Biggest thing you can do is just diversify, diversify, diversify. Try to try to be in, um, try to be competent, skilled, professional, maybe even an expert in as many different ways to make money for yourself. Pay down your debt. That's all you can do. That's all you can do. Awesome. Yeah. All right, let's go to a listener question. Here we go. So uh, I'm gonna. I'm hopefully gonna pronounce your name correctly, and I apologize if I didn't. I will try my best. Uh, so Baraka Sikawa emailed us on Thursday of last week. Uh, no, this was just yesterday. Good day, Lance and Al Gore. I've been listening to your podcast since episode zero, the pilot episode, and I'm now on the episode where you talk about your architectural firm and contractor companies. I am currently in Tanzania, East Africa, and we are almost in the same situation with two firms, both practicing architecture or in the AEC industry, one online, international, and the other traditional architecture firm. I was wondering how you were able to set up the two companies in terms of share structure, accounting, and organizational structures so that you could focus your time and resources. So the easy answer is, you know, you make two separate companies, you make two separate bank accounts, you make two separate QuickBooks. However you want to do the partnership is between, you know, 
however you and your partner are operating and stuff like that. And you just split it rationally, 50, 50, 75, 25, whatever you want to do. But it, it's separate. Your accountant has access to both of them. Uh, you separate everything legally and financially. Yeah. The, I'd say the biggest, it, the biggest problem that I hear people run into is that they, they are mixing accounts. So that is like, the, you know, you start at the base level, like Al said, of, of, of setting up the different companies. And, and you don't have to, when it comes to like the company type of structure, you should be talking to your tax professional with it. I will just tell you that throughout the years, our tax professionals have evolved and changed and, and they've advised us in certain different ways. And and I, the point I'm making about that is that even if you started out with like a basic LLC for one of the companies, you can always move it into an S corp. You can move it. You can move the distinction later on. So you're not strictly focused on on one of those. Um, just make sure whenever you do get to the S corp level <clears throat> that you're holding annual meetings and and keeping up with whatever whatever the government is telling you you have to do for that. It's just good practice anyway. But the bank accounts is the trickiest one. Like people just seem to get themselves in trouble because they mix personal with professional. And then even if you're trying, like let's say you had the two companies. I think you should want to split those, uh, not only just to try to keep uh, better accounting, but then let, let's say in the future you want to ever go sell the companies and stuff like that. Like you have to, it just needs to look like a clean bill of sale, bill of everything when, when you're doing all of that stuff. When it comes to the accounting side of stuff, like QuickBooks is really neat uh, for us and we're, we're not paid by them or anything like that. I'm sure FreshBooks, I think Mark sells that. There's other ones too. PQE software. Yeah, there's all different kinds of ones. Uh, those ones, um, they have a really nice feature, like QuickBooks does. QuickBooks has a nice feature of like we have one account with QuickBooks, but we can just easily switch between the two companies and see where everything is going. Um, so, the 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 thing though that helps us focus our time and our and our resources, without having to worry about all that stuff, um, is just setting it up right from the beginning. And having having a bookkeeper is huge. I think that's like one of the biggest giant things that Al we we ended up doing it right away. And the thing that well, not right away, three years into business, so it's okay to kind of be in startup phase right about. Maybe you don't. You just do some basic accounting and stuff. Um, but having a bookkeeper that you can rely on that every month reconciles your books, keeps things up to date. So then hopefully you can be a prophetic like Al with the profit and see where things are landing because we're. We're constantly, I mean, I was just sending an email to ours earlier this week of, hey, please let me know when the books are updated so I can see where our profit was from last month. Because there's a lag. There's always a lag on that just because we finished the end of the for month. everything. Yeah, like so everything it takes went. like a week or two for that to get caught up. But it's su- it's super important because then, then, I mean, you really want to know what does it cost every month to run the company? You have to know that. So then you can see, okay, here's where I got to be at with where I'm billing out at. Like it's an instant health check on the place. And then that helps alleviate your anxiety and all of that good stuff. So that you can focus your time and resources. Obviously, if you're using our, if you're using uh, Revit, uh, you uh, trying to get a system down like we have with Revit rocket chip. And then if you're looking for like company improvement to again, help you focus your time and resources, I think reading a book like we read, like to the, the two second lean has been just immensely, immensely valuable if for nothing else, it holds everybody accountable every two weeks for knowing they have to come up with something lean or something that we're going to learn from. And the, 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 like my examples lately have been sort of a refocusing the firm on stuff like simple stuff that maybe got lost in the mix, but it's at least that facilitating that meeting every two weeks, short, five to ten minutes, gave me a framework to be able to say, hey, guys and gals, we're getting feedback from the field. These manuals are getting serious. Or even for single-family homes, we have to start coordinating the HVAC stuff. Like, we have to start doing this. And, and we, I think we lost focus of it. And then now we have. Today I talked about thinking about foundation costs in two different ways and as some real-world examples so that we can hopefully serve everybody better, even if we aren't being the contractor. So like getting just in a routine like that, that is focused is super helpful. And Al hates meetings. I I don't like, I don't don't hate him as much as him, but we still, but those meetings are still that valuable. 
Oh, for sure. That's yep. on. And they're structured the right way. There's yeah. a whole system. It's to not it. a lengthy yeah. craziness. Yeah. Short, you know and short and sweet. You go to buildabettercompany.com. Wow. Find out more. Oh. Really make a system. Buildabetterco.com. Co.com. Right? Co. Yeah. Make real profit. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. No big deal. Well, with that, let's bring down the crew for ARE Jeopardy. Here we go. Woo. Which of the following areas are required to be accessible? This is an IBC <coughs> question. Um, is it A, a construction site? B, utility buildings? C, raised boxing or wrestling rings? Or D, worship assembly spaces? Show them. Yep, that's D. That's easy. <coughs> question two. Medical care facilities are classified under what group? A, group B, business. B, group A, assembly. C, group I, institutional. D, group M, mercantile. Mercantile. Merc. Medical care facilities. Doo -doo -doo. C, C, C. Everyone has two points, Lance. You better get some tricky questions. Minor tricky. Him. Number three, which of the following is not a characteristic of a double skin facade? A, it consists of two layers of glass separated by an air gap. B, it improves thermal insulation and acoustics. C, it requires less maintenance than a traditional facade. D, it is more expensive than a traditional facade. Number three, which of the following is not a characteristic of a double skin facade? Is it A, consists of two layers of glass separated by an air gap? B, it improves thermal insulation and acoustics? C, it requires less maintenance than a traditional facade? D, it is more expensive than a traditional facade? C, C, C? Correct wow. answer, C. Three, 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 three. Number four, good thing we got a tiebreaker. Yeah. Number four, which of the following materials has the lowest embodied carbon? Is it A, concrete, B, steel, C, timber, D, rammed earth? Ooh, this might trick some people. Yeah, we still still have a little, tie, though. little. We still have a tie. We have, what do we got? The answer is D, rammed earth. Ross got, wins! <laughs> Georgia Boys or Long Beach Tap House? Georgia Boys is my pick. I picked Tap House. What do you guys pick? All right, that's it. That Winner. democracy got you. It got me. Theocracy here. Yeah. Take us out, Lance. Exactly. Well, if you like this episode, if you're watching on YouTube, like, subscribe, leave us a positive comment. If you're listening on iTunes, five-star review. Don't forget to send us gifts. Don't forget to send us listener questions. See you next week.